Waving. It's a really effective way to get someone's attention, whether you're in a crowd or if you're a parasite infecting the brain of a fish trying to get the attention of a bird. Now, hello everyone, my name is Worm Talk. I have a PhD in biology, and I like to make informative and hopefully entertaining videos about parasitology without all the fear mongering that you see on places like TikTok, Instagram, and even YouTube. And today I wanted to talk about how a brain parasite infects fish can help it wave at birds to grab their attention. Now, before I jump into this video topic, please just make sure to like and subscribe as it helps this channel grow, and it will help you see my upcoming videos about how social media health influencers are using parasite cleanser scams to kind of scam people out of their money due to their insecurities, their fears, and sometimes their delusions. So make sure to follow if you want to see those upcoming videos. And let's start talking about brain parasites. So waving. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. How would a parasite do this? And more importantly, why would a parasite offer such a friendly gesture? Well, first we need to talk a little bit about how this parasite makes a living. You see, the main parasite we're going to be talking about today is Euhapilorchis californensis. Like many parasites, this little guy has multiple hosts, with this specific parasite requiring three different animals to complete its life cycle, which is really common among the trematode, or commonly known as the fluke parasites, which typically have some of the most complex, and in my opinion, the most interesting life cycles. And that's right, it's time to talk about the life cycle again. Now, when talking about life cycles, I typically like to start at the end with the final or the definitive host, which is just the host the parasite sexually reproduces in and lays its eggs. And for this parasite, it's the bird that fills this role, which was initially discovered in the 1950s by feeding parasite cysts to baby chickens in the lab, which was actually a really common method back in the day. And where do they get those parasite cysts from? Well, for this parasite, it's the California killifish, which is the second intermediate host for this parasite, and is a very common fish found in Southern California. Specifically, these parasites were taken from the brain of this fish, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, these poor infected fish picked up their brain worms by just swimming through the water, and by doing this, they happened to encounter cercaria, which is the swimming stage of trematode parasites that is released from an infected snail. When the cercaria encounters the fish, it will penetrate the skin and migrate to the brain, presumably following the blood vessels or the nerve tract. Now, cercaria are kind of a quantity over quality life stage, and they're released in the hundreds by infected snails every day. And for this species, it's specifically the horn snails that are really common in mudflats of California. And they themselves became infected after encountering a stage that is released in the bird's feces from a bird with the adult worm in its guts, thus completing the life cycle. And if you want to know more about this specific type of trematode life cycle, I actually made a longer video on parasite gigantism, which I'll have linked in the comments if you're interested. Now, this system may seem a little convoluted, but in practice, it works really effectively for the parasite, as evidenced by the fact that in regions where this snail is present, it is not uncommon for 100% of the killifish to have these brain worms. And I don't mean one or two, I mean hundred to thousands of these brain worms are often recovered from these infected fish. But why is it so effective? How could something so complicated work so well? Well, as I mentioned, these snails get infected and start to shed these parasites, and they will shed upwards of a hundred parasites a day. Now, the majority of these sucaria will float in the water till they die, but a fraction of them are fortunate enough to encounter a fish. And over the fish's lifespan, these parasites will start to accumulate. As these parasites start to build up in the fish's brain, the fish will start to act differently, unsurprisingly. Specifically, it will start to have more erratic behavior, and what's occurring is these parasites are actually altering the fish's behavior to live more dangerously. And by doing this, the fish are much more likely to be predated upon than an uninfected fish. This observation was made by Lafferty and Morris in a study they published in 1996 in which they collected killifish from two different locations. Now, one region, it was known that these fish are pretty much all infected, but at the second location, they picked because there are no horn snails present, and as a result, none of these fish are infected. So these researchers collected these fish, and they brought them back to their lab. Then, once at lab, they kept them in the same general large tank, and then over a span of time, they watched these fish every day, and they observed and recorded all their interactions. And what they found is, that infected fish were four times more likely to engage in behaviors like flashing, contorting, shimmering, or jerking. 
Now, these researchers hypothesized that these behaviors are risky and could lead to these fish being predated upon at greater frequency. So the researchers, they set out to test this hypothesis, and what they did is they set up a large pen experiment. Specifically, they set up two of these, and what this is, it's an enclosure on a pond where they took some fencing, some mesh fencing for the fish, and they kept a little section of this pond closed off. And in this section, they were able to put infected and non-infected fish. Now, they set up two of these enclosures. One of these enclosures had the top sealed off by netting, and this was meant to be the control. So this netting on the top would prevent predatory birds from coming in and eating the fish, where the second one, the netting was not there. So birds could come in and they could eat the fish as they chose. And by doing this, they could compare how many of the infected fish got eaten compared to the non-infected fish, and they could make sure that there was nothing else going on in the environment killing the fish. And at the end of 20 days, the researchers went back to these ponds and they collected all the fish. They brought them back to lab where they necropsied them, which is, again, just a fancy word for dissection. And then they could pair how many of these fish were infected and how heavy their infections were, allowing them to understand if the parasite actually increases rate of predation in a field setting where both non-infected and infected fish were living side by side. And what they found was that the infected fish were somewhere between 10 and 30 times more likely to get eaten than their non-infected counterpart. In fact, the non-infected fish had pretty much negligible death, where the infected fish were shown to have more than 50% of them eaten throughout this experiment. And the data showed that the more heavily infected a fish was, the more likely it was to be consumed. Due to these experiments, the researchers largely concluded that these movements of infected fish weren't just quirks of being infected, but were intentional to increase the predation risk for the fish. Now, one caveat that I must mention is that this study only used one single large pen for their experiment, which is technically problematic as it's called pseudo-replication, which is a statistical issue. But fortunately, other researchers have taken up this mantle and have conducted follow-up experiments working with the same general species. And in 2023, a similar study was done. However, in this experiment, they were able to infect the fish purposefully rather than rely on naturally infected fish, giving them more control over the experiments. And what they found was similar, though less intense. Specifically, some of these conspicuous behaviors that were observed in the first study were still present. However, they weren't as intense. Specifically, they were about 1.8 times more prevalent in the infected fish rather than the non-infected fish and that some of these behaviors are more associated with another trematode species that infects the liver and muscle tissue and not the brain. Though in this study there is another caveat in that in their conclusions they point out that they only used young fish and did remote observation using a camera to not stress the fish. This may have influenced these results. They state that the increased stress may have increased these behaviors, so when predators are around, the parasitized fish is more likely to act out. I've made a huge mistake. So by not stressing the fish, they're actually somewhat underrepresenting what the parasite is doing to the fish. Moreover, in this second study, they used relatively young fish, and this is probably decreasing the manipulation of the parasite as well. I say this because the way these types of parasites work is that they just alter behaviors that already exist, rather than truly mind control their host. You see, some of these described behaviors, such as flashing, are known to be mating behaviors in these fish. So rather than forcing the fish to do something wholly unnatural to itself, it is believed that these parasites just stimulate certain behaviors at inappropriate times, such as when a bird is in near proximity to the fish. It does this, or is believed to do this, by altering neurotransmitters in the fish's brain, with one study specifically finding that E. californensis, the name of the parasite, density was associated with increased dopaminergic activity in the hypothalamus and decreased serotonergic activity in the hippocampus. And what might be surprising is that although conspicuous behavior in these fish is strongly associated with the number of parasites in the brain and other tissues, remarkably, the heavily infected killifish grow and reproduce normally, despite having thousands of cysts inside their brain cases. So in other words, this parasite has evolved to heavily infect fish without damaging them, allowing them to be the ideal intermediate host, able to carry hundreds of worms to the next host without dying from the infection. And for the birds, these worms are believed to be fairly short-lived and to cause minimal to no pathology, so it's really just giving them an easier meal, making this parasite an important player in the ecosystem, but also a cool one. 
Thank you all for watching. I hope you liked this video, found it informative. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe if you actually enjoy it. And I'm gonna go play Stardew Valley as I just made it to Ginger Island and it's very exciting. So have a good one.